and our current set of plugins for Lightwave 3D, which is nice that we actually um, delayed this by a couple of weeks, is Quick Pick, which was just released a couple of weeks ago. Um, then there's the DBNW tools that we have just moved to uh, Patreon uh, this month. Um, XRTrader and XRTrader Pro, uh, where XRTrader Pro is essentially just an extension to the existing XRTrader. Um, there's Nodemeister, which was released this year as well, FrameD and InfiniMap. So Quick Pick, that's the one that we've just released, is essentially a navigation system for Lightwave 3D layout, which is built for speed, shortcut oriented, um, works in multi-selections if possible, and you can also customize it to your liking. And as you can see, I've selected some items. And the way I've configured it is um, Quick Pick itself is being launched when I press the Q button. And there you see a menu, a menu that pops up that allows you to select items, objects, bones, lights, camera, edit surfaces, either in the surface editor or the node editor. And you can also edit plugins that are attached to the items. Um, add plugins to the to the selected items, remove them, run generic uh, plugins, which is, um, I think, that huge list in utilities, the additional list, this one. And you can also build your own menu set. And uh, the, the way it's supposed to be used is that, you know, essentially you just press QI and you can select an item directly without, you know, doing anything else. Or QP, and then you have the uh, plugins and you can just open one here. So as opposed to, you know, just to, to uh, for example, uh, get to XR Trader or another image filter, you would have to press Control F8, then get to the image filters, then click on that, double click, and then it eventually opens. Or it should, yep. Um, you're just much faster if you use the shortcuts like this. And um, one, one thing that's interesting is if you select multiple items like this and you add a plugin, then uh, I'm not sure if that's visible uh, on the stream, but you have a little rotate icon behind some of these. And that means that if you add these plugins now, they're going to be applied to all the items that are currently selected. And if I want to remove them again, I can just press Q, press R for remove. And there you see I've got the displacement lazy points uh, assigned to three of the selected items and the rotate arrow behind it says it's a multi-selection. I can just remove it from all three of those and the plugin's going to be gone from those uh, three items. Uh, one more thing or a big thing you can do is you also have your custom item, which in my case looks like this. And you can basically put all the commands that you have in Lightwave in there, um, even something as silly as edit plugins. And you have uh, an option to actually edit that, where you can just add items to the to the uh, menu. We just find something. I've done that already, but let's yeah report a bug. And as you can see, the next time I open the custom menu, I've got a new report a bug. In, in the options, you also have this loop over multi-selection thing. So if you have an item or a command that's being called, and it's a command that uh, acts on a currently selected item, if you activate this loop over multi-selection option, then um, what QuickPick will do is select the first item, run the command, then select the second item that you selected, run the command, then the third, and so on, until all of the items you have selected in your multi-selection have been processed then it restores the original multi-selection again. So uh, for some commands that may be useful. And yeah, um, that's basically what QuickPick does. Um, as I said, um, the interesting thing is that you can just, you know, get, get to stuff really quickly by just pressing two keys and bam, you're there. That's what it was essentially designed for. Um, you can kind of slow things down a bit if you like to. For example, if you have the, you have the sticky option, which means that once you've selected something, an item, the main menu stays open and you can even move it. And since, as you can see, the title bar is kind of busy here with the operating system controls, which I couldn't get rid of, and it's a bit tricky to actually select this. You can even use the cursor keys just to move the panel. 
Oh yeah, it could be uh, yeah, the OpenGL issue. You can even move, use the cursor keys to move the panel. Escape closes it as it should. And um, also, one thing it does, even if the panel is sticky and you're like somewhere working somewhere else, like me in the bottom right, if you press Q again, it's just going to center the panel on on the mouse cursor again. So yeah, um, that's essentially what it does. Um, there isn't much more I can actually say about Quick Pick. And yeah, that was, uh, as I said, released two weeks ago. And yeah, we, we tried to keep it as simple as possible. I mean, there's just always lots of things you could add in terms of features, customizations and everything. But um, what we wanted to do is for now, keep it as, as simple as possible. Just um, add the plugin, assign a shortcut to it and work with it. No need to configure it, just, you know, get going. Until the beginning of these, this month, um, the DBW tools were freely available for our website, and they were essentially small utility nodes that we wrote things, you know, to, to check some coding techniques or quick ideas that you could implement in a couple of hours. And we decided to basically give them a way to, to advertise for us. And also because, you know, some of the, the Plugins didn't really make sense as a product, but we still thought that it would be very useful for people to use. And it seems that they are. Now, at the beginning of the month, 1st of November, we decided to basically go next level with the DBW tools. Um, they're now on Patreon. And as far as I know, um, we're probably the first uh, DCC plugin developer that is on Patreon. Um, what we wanted to do is get more support from the, from the community, also work together more closely with the people that actually use the DBMW tools. So, um, the idea is that you support us on Patreon. On the other hand, uh, you get to discuss features with us, uh, vote on what's going to be the next plugin of the month. And obviously we're going to add one new plugin per month. Um, which can also you know, take more time to develop than just two or three hours. And we also have a live development stream. We're going to have a live Q&A stream on Tuesday, I think. And yeah, plenty of uh, fruitful discussions and silly discussions on our Discord. Um, depending on which tier you use, you also get priority support, which uh, essentially means that um, um, you will get bug fixes uh, as soon as possible and, and things like that. And uh, let me just point to the, uh, so yeah, we're announcing our Q&A hangout. Um, we had a vote for what the plugin should be the next one, which is here. We had the option of a multi-maths node, which is basically all kinds of mathematical functions uh, within one node. So you can use a pop-up to change from one to the other. A multi-switcher node, which would have been a node um, where you have, let's say, uh, multiple color inputs and one scalar value that uh, defines which of the inputs is going to be output. And you could add as many inputs as you want to. And the third one is the triplanar image mapping node, which is basically a kind of cubic mapping, but with uh, blended edges. And uh, yeah, the people have spoken. Um, the triplanar node actually won. And we started uh, developing it uh, right after the vote. And uh, we have sent out a first version of that already to, to our patrons, which looks like this. <clears throat> so what we essentially have here is, uh, let me just use quick pick. Move this. And this was the, the, the first version, which is more of a triplanar mixer. So you have an input for every axis. And what it does is it blends between them. Okay. So this is essentially what the triplanar blending does. It, it takes an image for, for every axis. And then um, as you increase the actual blend value, you will see that these areas get smoother. And if you actually use an image that is maybe even tiled, 
you will be able to really simply uh, texture more organic uh, shapes or shapes that uh, you know just need some kind of texture but you don't want to make it uh, too obvious that you're just repeating So this one was essentially the first test, just to see if the whole thing works. And it's going to also going to be released as a separate plugin. Um, that's a part of the tools, uh, mainly because it actually allows you to have full control over what you input for every axis. Um, but the actual triplanar mapping node looks like this, so you can actually select uh, one image or three image, one, one per axis, and it gives you all the normal image projection options. And you can control the blend up there. And yeah, that's going to be our plugin of the month for November. And then for December, we'll have to think of one or two new ones for people to pick. Um, yes, the Q and A's are recorded <clears throat> or will be recorded. It's going to be a Google Hangout, and you can even join if you want to. And just like the development stream, it's going to be a, a hidden link, so you can uh, watch it later if you want to. All right, so um, that's what we have been doing with the DBNW tools right now. And for those that don't actually know them, let me just go to the wiki page. It's probably the easiest. Just a second. Um, what do you need triplanar for? Um, it, it just helps if you have something like, you know, uh, rocks or landscape or something like that, and you just need to quickly texture it with something that's tiled without, you know, creating UVs. You just slap it on there and it's done. So it's not really something you would use, you know, to detail texture your hero items, but for background items where you just, you know, want a texture on it without um, explicitly creating some planar or UV mapping coordinates. That's what it's there for. <clears throat> yeah, so um, there we go. We have all kinds of nodes there from color space conversions, uh, chroma keying, uh, simple color corrector, which is this one, um, which gives you know basic uh, color correction uh, tools you can use in any nodal key. Um, material tweaker that allows you to uh, tweak the output of the current materials by um, boosting components if you want to or tinting them. Um, we have um, a channel blender which allows you to convert a vector to a scalar and back again. Um, also one thing that's quite interesting we have uh, variables nodes. Let me just see if I can find it or I'll just create a new scene quickly. Yep. So what you can do, we have this thing called uh, the variables. Let me just take rotation. And essentially the same thing. The interesting uh, difference is that this is actually going to be evaluated multiple times per frame if you wanted to. So you can actually have motion blur on the projection of textures as opposed to just on the items that have the textures on them. So let me just basically create the same, same envelope here. that linear as well. Pipe that into the rotation. And evaluate, interpolate it, and boom, you can see that I've actually got some motion blur on this now. Let me just... The only difference between basically this and this is the fact that the rotation that's being used on this uh, on the image itself is in in the case of the rotation variable actually being interpolated per sample where light wave evaluates the image and those are some of the things we have in the tools 
And I thought this one was quite neat um, because we actually don't have any other option to have some motion blur on the surfacing. And I was surprised to see that it actually works. Uh, so what else do we have in there? We have a couple of pixel filters, uh, also the simple color corrector as a pixel filter. The interesting thing is that in 2018, that actually works in real time. And one of the plugins we added is the tone, tone mapper, which is basically just a, a variety of, of a exposure and contrast. So you can you know, increase the exposure, increase the contrast, and you have something like this. But you can do it interactively while VPR renders and basically use that as a preview to what your image will look like if you later on apply tone mapping uh, in post. But you can also have this actually affect the final render if you want to. And uh, one thing we added this month for our patrons um, is essentially the same principle, except that the, uh, the way the contrast is computed is identical to how V-Ray does it. Um, which tends to give the lighter and the darker areas a bit more space. You can also apply the color corrector. And since it's a pixel filter in 2018, this is going to be interactive as well. So you can, you know, <clears throat> boost the saturation if you want to. And increase the gamma. This will actually read out, uh, render out, yes. And the exposure will only render out if you have the effect final render on. And yeah, if you want, you can uh, tint it to a certain color. Um, just invert the colors, which is crazy. Or just, you know, let's keep this as 200. Maybe just change the hue. All the kinds of stuff you can do with a normal uh, color corrector. Um, yeah, you have a color space converter. Um, the surface selector. It's basically a pop-up like Quick Pick, but just for the uh, surface nodes, and it's essentially the, the predecessor of Quick Pick. Um, and some window-specific things, and one of the plugins that was created really quickly, but is super useful, is Render Delta, which let me just tap the right thing. So what Render Delta uh, does is it kind of remembers the render time for the current image. And then once you render a second one, it will compare it and tell you if the second render is actually quicker or not. All right, so this one took 23.9 seconds and the render delta doesn't show anything at the moment. But let me just change the camera settings, maximum samples to, I don't know, eight, but have a minimum of four samples. And if I render again, last one took 23.9 seconds. Yeah, this one, eight, 8.8. .8. And as you can see, the render delta says it uh, shows it in green, which means it's faster. And it took 26.8% of the render before that. And yes, all the plugins are uh, Mac OS compatible. The only exception is some of the older tools are only available for Windows. Um, for example, there is a few here. There is a render audio notifier which basically allows you to assign noises or sounds to when you're starting to uh, to render a frame or when a frame render has done, when a scene has been loaded, saved. Um, that's just because it's a capability that isn't available on Mac OS like that. Um, then there's the render priority, which automatically lowers the priority of Lightwave when it's rendering, either via F9 or F10, just in layout. And yeah, that's not available on macOS as well. Um, but everything else uh, is. And the same is true for all the other plugins. So yeah, I think that's a, a quick look at what the tools do. Um, I mean, we, we still have plenty of ideas for um, future tools. So um, it's not like we're gonna run out once the three ideas we, we had open for a vote uh, are going to be implemented because there's <clears throat> plenty more coming and i suspect uh, knowing the people that support us on patreon there's going to be plenty plenty of new ideas uh, by them as well
So XR Trader is one of our things, our second oldest plugin. And it was initially developed uh, just as a test to uh, see if we could get you know, OpenEXR to work in general, if you could get it to work within Lightwave. And um, it quickly ended up you know, being a nice layered export. Uh, recently this year, we've um, also added uh, a new version of XR Trader called XR Trader Pro. That uh, also allows you to save crypto mats, which I'm going to show in a bit. Um, I would say that the main difference between XR Trader and XR Trader Pro is that XR Trader just saves the buffers as Lightwave produces them, whereas XR Trader Pro um, can also create its own buffers or modify the buffers in a way that you can't just do by image processing and the first example of that is the crypto mats and as opposed to lightwave itself or to the to the native open xr export um, xr trader allows you to select the compression schemes to use for the images you can uh, change the pixel type um, how it's going to be stored in the file per channel and you also have a data window support which is essentially like a limited region within the image and uh, XR Trader can even compute the data window automatically per frame. So if let's say you have uh, an item that's moving on a black background that you're going to use as a layer, um, XR, XR Trader can automatically only save that rectangular region within your image that actually contains some pixels and leave everything that's you know blank background out from the final file which makes it much quicker to actually load those images into applications um, especially those that support data windows like nuke or fusion this is the uh, main user interface um, the top is uh, uh, basically the, the main settings that you have if it should uh, save the images only when you render sequences on an f10 or um, always, even when you just render an F9 uh, single image preview, or if it should actually never save, uh, which means that it only saves when you're rendering on a network, uh, on, a, on a render farm using LWSN. And that's kind of designed to protect you from accidentally writing over final images that you think are perfectly fine, and that you only want to write over when you're uh, eventually rendering on your farm. This is going to take a bit longer than the previous renders, mainly because um, with the current setting, uh, XR Trader actually requests all the buffers from Lightwave, and certain buffers can really, you know, slow down a render. And I suppose what's interesting about XR Trader as well is that uh, when it was launched, it was certainly the most complete Open XR saver for renderer that you know supported essentially every feature that that XR, that open xrs themselves actually had so this is my final render let's just go back to, uh, to xr trader and yeah there we have the buffers preview which um has been stored at a third of the render size so it's blurry just because you know um, it's basically a third smaller and this is actually a custom image viewer that we've written because um 2018 dropped some of the uh parts of the SDK that we actually used to display images before that. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for, for something like that, that that's where the uh, data window comes in. <clears throat> All right, so um, basically we have a set of buffers that Lightwave generated. They're all listed in here. You can actually change them here as well. And just use cursor up, cursor down to go through them. And this way you can actually look at each one of them and see what's in there and see if you actually need that uh, for your composite or not. So that's one thing that we thought was very important, the ability to actually check the buffers from your render and see, okay, I, I want this or I don't want that. So you can select them quickly. In general, though, if you uh, render your final images and once you've um, picked the buffers to save, you should turn store all buffers off. Uh, turn it off, you just leave it on so you can have an overview like this so you see which buffers you actually need. So um, basically, as <laughs> Stata kind of said, if you actually want to save a buffer, you have to enable it right here. And that should nowadays also enable it for Lightwave itself. 
And as you can see here, everything with a, with a checkbox in front of it is going to be saved later on in your file. And also the selection you create here or the, the, the current buffer that you select here and what you see in the, the preview window is going to be in sync for every uh, layer that you save. You have an option of the pixel type. Normally, I would say everything should be 60-bit float, with the ex exception of IDs, depending on the compositing application, but those should actually be integers. And um, depth should be 32 bits because you probably need the extra precision when it comes to computing depth or using depth uh, properly in, in compositing. Um, and the fit data window for an individual layer would basically incorporate that layer into computing uh, the region where um, the image actually contains pixel data and then just save that. Um, you have some simple processing options. You can rename your channels depending on what your compositing application wants. Oh, the layer name. Yes, yes. Uh, for the final name uh, layer, it is, uh, it is usually blank because um, if you go to the review settings here, you will see that you know, currently we are saving the buffer final render just as RGBA, just as a channel names. Um, if an application loads an uh, OpenXR image, the first thing it does is it looks for channels named RGBA and assumes that these are like the default channels to look at. That's why um, by default, uh, the final render actually doesn't have a layer name. All the other ones do. As you can see here, for example, if it's the transparency buffer, then the layers are going to be called, or the, the channels are going to be called transparency RGB. Um, the thing is, when it comes to OpenEXR, um, the, the, the concept of a layer is just a, a naming concept because uh, you can actually only name channels. So um, the standard essentially says, well, uh, if you want a layer name, you put your layer name, then a dot, and then your channel name. And that's um, yeah how you separate you know layers and, and, uh, and channels, because essentially we only have channels in here called R and Z and object.id and transparency.r. But um, from the convention, you can f see that, okay, transparency is meant to be a layer with you know three different kinds of channels in it. Object ID or object is also going to be one layer with a channel called ID in it. And yeah, since you can actually change the names for the channels and for the layer, um, once you found out how your compositing application likes to use them, you can always save that as a preset. And the interesting thing is if you save a preset and call it default, then next time that you add XR Trader to a new scene, it's going to load that setting in as your default setting. And the light wave options are essentially the options you have in the uh, in the buffers panel. So these ones, and we just added them here for convenience as well. So you know, if I apply, if I add noise filtering here, it's on here as well. The same goes, I think, for the reconstruction filters. And it kind of keeps them in sync because you know, it kind of. Uh, would have been a pain to just have to be able to move over to the render properties just to change those settings. And yeah, the, the review settings um, gives you uh, basically a chance to actually look into more detail on um, what you're actually saving, what you're calling it. And it also tries to find out problems in your name if possible, like um, having two different channels that end up having the same name. It calls the art and that and says, all right, wait, there's something you have to check. Plus you have the metadata. You can embed a small preview if the application that reads it support it. And you can also add a comment and an author, which in this case is me. And it also stores lots and lots of additional metadata that some application can read out. That, that's anything from the name of the machine that rendered uh, that current frame. So you can debug your render form by looking at the, the, the metadata of an image to things like uh, camera transformations, uh, focal length of the camera, things like that.
and the position position of the camera as well. Lots of stuff like that is also stored in the metadata. So if you have an application that can read those out and make use of those. So basically um, the big thing that we added this year to uh, um, EXR Trader Pro is the ability to actually write uh, crypto mats. And what a crypto mat is, is uh, essentially uh, an automatically generated, specially formatted open EXR image that contains all the possible item or surface mats for render with soft edges. And if you look at this, does that work? No, it doesn't. Sorry, I suck at nuke. So this is essentially uh, the final render that we have. And I've got crypto mats uh, saved. Oh, there we go. And it essentially looks uh, like this. And for Nuke, as well as for Fusion, and now for After Effects, you have uh, special plugins to actually extract the crypto mats uh, from the scene. So in this case, I can just use the picker and add something like this. And I've got the helicopter uh, as an object. And if I zoom in, you can actually see that you know you have fairly smooth edges here. And what I've done in that tool is I've basically just uh, changed the hue just of the item called helicopter. Let me just open this quickly as well. Yeah, as you can see, this is just the helicopter itself changing the hue, which is the, the thing that's being designated as, as yellow here. An interesting thing about crypto mats is that um, the selection of the items um, is text-based. So as you can see here, the, 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 the mat list of the things that I've selected is actually RC underscore helicopter, which is the item name in Lightwave. If I switch over to crypto materials, for example, and also pick that part, it's actually, let me just clear it first, it's actually plexiglass, which is this surface. I click on this as well. It's texture body. I can also just edit it here. And that also implies that if you use the same selection for your mats from one scene to the next, it's going to um, work just as well as long as the names of the items or the surfaces is the same. So you can basically add those and if you if you look at this again, you'll see that the hue shift has now been applied to this part and that part. What we've seen here in, in Nuke now is um, the crypto mat that was imported with the setting. And um, um, these are buffers that uh, XR Trader creates in addition to those provided by Lightwave. Um, as you can see here, there's also XR Trader Helper Pixel Filter. That's the one that actually extracts the information that Lightwave needs. And um, if you have a license for XR Trader Pro, you will get to see this additional crypto mat tab here that allows you to select a file, select the compression, and it actually only allows you to select one of the lossless compressions um, because as soon as you use a lossy uh, pro, um, compression for the crypto mats, then the whole matching of an ID to a name is not going to work because essentially the IDs are going to go wonky. There's three kinds of crypto mats that are being, uh, that uh, XS Reddit can generate. One is uh, an item crypto mat, which is basically um, the ability to be able to select items later on in compositing. The other one's uh, surface. And the third one is the hierarchy um, crypto mat, which is essentially um, the name of an item or the, the name of the parents of an item. So you can select all the items that are the children of, say, RC Copter in this case, 
and it's just going to be one single selection. And since all three of these can be extracted using individual nodes in Nuke or in Fusion or nowadays in After Effects as well, you can essentially um, combine those the, the extracted mats as well if you need you know more fine tuning like say something that's on this item but only that surface and um the levels uh, okay you could also um save each layer either as a separate cryptomat file or as a layer within the, the main cryptomat file one thing that xr trader doesn't allow because we didn't think it made sense is to actually add the cryptomats to your main render because it does add lots of weight and in many cases you might actually not uh, need the crypto mat so you know it would actually slow down things quite a lot and uh, the next option is the amount uh, the number of levels which essentially t uh, is the amount of different mats that the crypto mat can store per pixel now um, with six levels you could have like six different items that cover the same pixel but that selection of six items can change from one pixel to the next. So anything beyond six is very, very unusual. And yeah, next you can pick the name of the layer. If you save it as a separate file, you can have a file name for that. And the manifest is essentially a text file that um, gives you, um, that tells, uh, the compositing application what the individual items are actually named and that can be either embedded into the openexr file or it can be external per frame or you can use one external file for the whole scene um, which you then write manually and of course if you go to the review settings this will show up as well uh, review settings is also extremely useful because we have uh, variables here you can use and the review settings kind of show you what the actual paths are going to look like once those variables are going to be taken into account. All right, thanks. Well, I was just about to, to, to wrap up XR Trader, but there's one last thing I wanted to point people at because that's something we added um, for the latest release as well. That's a small help here. Um, yeah, inline help in a plugin. And it's basically just to remind you of the, the, the most important things, which is what do the different compression modes in OpenEXR do? So you don't have to actually look them up in the uh, manual every single time. And the other one is um, the variables you have uh, to use in your file names. And some of those are quite nice, like the scene version, for example. So if I call this scene, let me just save this scene. Uh, find the save scene increment there you go now it's called rc helicopter crypto underscore v0001 and if i actually add let's say here scene version and go to review settings you will see that it actually extracted the uh, version number and you can use that to create your own file names or name directories or things like that. And also whatever you type in here, if uh, that means that you, to, to save a file, um, XR Trader would actually have to uh, create directories. It does that automatically for you. So there's no need for those directories to exist already. All right. And I think that's a wrap up on XR Trader. Notemeister which is essentially an extension of the compounds that exist in Lightwave already. And what it does is it uh, allows you to um, have one node graph that's basically your own node graph, and it's shared in other node graphs using a special node. And you can use it with uh, presets, for example. So if you have uh, an often used node graph that you need to use, you can save that as a preset. And uh, the main idea is to basically, on the one side, make complex nodal setups easier to create and also the ability to reuse nodal setups in different node graphs at the same time. 
And um, one thing we also added or made sure to, to add with the first patch that we, was, that we released was um, make it compatible with Octane because that's what many, many people asked for, which I don't think I'll be able to show because I don't have Octane installed at the moment. So what we have here is um, three very exciting primitives. If you look at the cube, you will see that all there is is just a principled BSDF shader. Now, the first thing I do is I add the NodeMeister node here and does it actually have a graph that's loaded? Yes. It actually has a, a graph that's being loaded with the current scene. So I'll just take the color, color output and hook it up. And as you can see, it doesn't do much except to turn this into white. So in here, there's a reference to another graph. So if I switch over to that, you will see that it takes an input color, runs that through a simple color corrector, and outputs that. So let me just hook this up to something else. Let's just make it a 3D corporal texture, for example. And as you can see, on the cube, I now have the crumple texture. And that would let you take the background color from here. So it's a, let's give it a nice black color. It's a black crumple on whatever comes in here, uh, comes through here. If I switch back, then this is the node that I've been using. Now, if I go to one of the other surfaces, let's go to the sphere. Yes, I'm using quick pick again. This is the sphere node graph, which also doesn't do much. And I will also let's make this a bit smaller. Add node master here. And it actually uses the last uh, node graph that I've been editing, or the last node master graph that I've been editing. So if I hook this up as well, you will see I also have the, the crumbled texture in there. And I can even change the background color right here in the user interface. So the procedural that's in both of these is the same. All the parameters for them are the same, except for the background color, which I've changed here. And let's do the same with a donut. Or wait, torus. It's a torus. And also add Nodemeister. Also hook it up. And let's give it a completely different background color, like blue. So essentially, what we have here is we have uh, the same procedural on three different surfaces from a, from the same node graph, but uh, the background color given to that procedural is uh, different from one node graph to the other. Um, well, I, I did I did compile the uh, Dennis's plugins for for Mac OS, but we kind of stopped doing that. Some more than a year, two or, two or three years ago, basically because we didn't really have the time. And to be quite frank, I don't really enjoy in developing on macOS either. So yeah, we decided to basically focus on our own plugins only. It's not the matter of making them compatible, it's the matter of compi uh, compiling them on the Mac and testing them there. All right, so... Um, one of the nice things is I can just go into this node graph, which is now shared by all three surfaces. And I can just make changes here, for example, swap out the uh, crumple texture with, uh, let's use bricks. Come on, where are they? Ah, there you are, okay. Let's look up the background color, there we go, and pipe them into the 
color here. And yeah, it's a bit too big. And essentially all three now have the bricks texture on them. Just by swapping out the procedural in one position, one place, and that's the node meister node graph. Um, there's a few things it does um, that the native compounds don't do. One of the main things is if there's an input here, like the color, it actually automatically creates a, a user interface control for that as well. So um, you can make more complex nodes that you know have some inputs um, that you don't actually need to connect to something to get some values into them. You just have a user interface control for them that you can use. And people have also been using it for things like synchronizing displacements based on procedurals to the actual shading of the surfaces based on the same procedurals. Um, what you can do is on, on the one side, you can also save the node graph that's being used in here as a preset. And you can also save the whole node with um, the node graph that it's using, as well as the input values for the controls as a preset as well, and just reuse them like that across different scenes. <clears throat> and one thing we added with the last version is also the uh, ability to have um, what we call a local graph, which uh, essentially makes um, the node master node behave exactly like a compound, where um, you're just nesting the node graph within the node master node, but it's not being shared with other nodes at the same time. So yeah, if, I would argue if, if you're like, you know, a proper node master as in the node freak, um, this is uh, one of the must have plugins to, you know, create more complex node graphs and to really leverage them across the different subsystems of uh, Lightwave. Now, frame D is based on some in-house plugins I wrote in 99, I think, for a short film that was um, basically hand-drawn animation, but composited in Lightwave, mainly because Lightwave was the only application that could handle that kind of data, um, because even compositing applications couldn't back then. We just had, you know, too many images, too many layers, and not enough memory. And um, it's a plugin for as it says, advanced image sequence management. So you can actually edit image sequences within Lightwave 3D um, using a, an X sheet or dope sheet. So you can define which image is going to be visible at which frame of your sequence. You can retime the image sequences using envelopes. Um, you can speed up interactivity by using an image cache and proxy images, which are basically just automatically scaled down images um, that are saved to disk. And one thing we added uh, this year was um, memory compression of the cache. So many images will just, you know, use like 20, 30, 40 percent less memory once loaded into RAM than they would uh, previously. What we have done for uh, Frame D was the last release is create a short uh, animated or short animation where we had uh, Dogma record a voice voiceover, and I quickly. Um, lip synced it using using images and this is the scene just used for the quick sync uh, for the lip syncing so this is the uh, sequence editor and what you can do is you can sync it to layout so as i scrub through layout here you will notice that the current frame up here updates as well And for every frame in the sequence, I can basically um, select a frame to, to insert from the frames that I've loaded. <clears throat> the interesting thing is that if you actually export this, it doesn't create like a new image sequence with 250 images in it, but it will just write a text file that references the, uh, references the images uh, used in here. And it will only load those into Lightwave as well. So, you know, especially if you're working together with uh, 
um, things like hand-drawn animation and where you have many many cycles and many loops of you know people walking people turning left people turning right um, that are being repeated then um, only the individual images are going to be loaded but not a whole image sequence that's been created with all the images that are inside it and this is one of the main uses um, the other one is also because you do have the uh, compression and the ability to automatically proxy images. Um, if you're working with huge backplates, um, you can really speed up your interactive workflow as well by um, basically loading your or, or converting your image sequence into a uh, frame D sequence and then load that in and have it automatically create proxies when you're working. Uh, in layout trying to, to match move or, or make something fit to your background animation or background sequence and then once you render it will actually um, just load the images at 100% using the original image files all right and the last one is infinimap which is the first product we ever released which was initially uh, developed to um, visualize the uh, Tour de France uh, bicycle race for German television. And then later turned into a proper product after a very, very lengthy uh, rewrite because we found that um, what we used in-house in wasn't really sufficient you know, to, to use as a product. All right, um, so, so basically the um, interesting thing about Infinimap is that it um, only loads parts of uh, the image that are actually being needed for the render. And the image that I'm using here for the blue marble is, uh, let me check. Yeah, it's uh, 43,000 by 2,100 uh, pixels, which um, if it was loaded into memory would use 5.26 uh, gigabytes. And currently just to render this, I'm only using 6.25 megabytes. So yeah, if you just remember that uh, the image that's actually projected here is really 40 by 20 K this is uh, fairly fast rendering. And one thing that's also interesting is that um, if you um, load a scene, it doesn't need to load the images into memory either because it just loads a reference to the image and doesn't actually um, touch the image um, before the render starts. So, um, if you're currently you know, using massive images in Lightwave that slow down loading your scene because it needs to load those huge images into layout as well, that won't happen because um, it actually doesn't load the images. It, well, uh, maybe not Voodoo, but <laughs> the, the, the interesting or the, the tricky thing about this is just to keep performance high um, during the render because it, it's constantly, um, loading parts of the image into the render uh, while you have multiple threads trying to you know use the, the, that the same image and not having them get into the way of each other but yeah that's essentially what infinimap does um, it also um, comes with a converter so you can uh, convert all the images that you have because it uses its uh, not its own proprietary format, but it uses a special kind of EXRs uh, with uh, tiles that can get fairly large on disk. But you know, once you're once you're rendering, once you're in memory, they are actually quite quite snappy to use. And yeah, I suppose one of those renders uh, already is much quicker than you know just loading that image. Um, no, it switches to different mid maps. Basically, um, the EXR that's being used here, that the one that Infinimap created, um, has the original image sliced up into tiles 
as well as different resolutions. So uh, depending on um, the size of one of the original image pixels in relation to whatever you're rendering to, it, um, uh, it, it extracts the image information from the resolution that it needs. So if you're really, really far away, like this, it's going to only extract uh, parts of the image from a very, very low resolution. Whereas if you're really close, like this, it will only extract the tiles that are, in this case, you know, around the UK, but at a very high resolution, but it won't actually extract anything else like Asia from the image. So it's a combination of being able to only extract specific areas from the image and also being able to extract uh, those areas at different resolutions or different scales. So it's one image, but the image contains all the resolutions and is sliced up. I mean, there, there is ways to kind of do that without pre-processing the image like that. Um, the problem is that it really, really slows down rendering and no, we thought that it makes, it's one image, yeah. And we, we thought it just makes more sense to actually um, pre-process an image once, but then just get the, the best performance out of it when rendering.